Well, it sounds like the Lord is with you this morning, church. Title of our lesson is A Jealous God. A Jealous God. Four points. Number one, the zeal of God. Number two, zeal for God. Number three, zeal like God. And number four, zeal celebrating God. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Here is the great passage about the prophecy of the Messiah. We read in verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. Verse 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establish and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Right here we see the prophecy of Jesus. The Bible says that into a land of darkness, in the land where there's the shadow of death, a great light will dawn. He says, there will be a child born. The government will be upon his shoulders. He'll be called a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, prince of peace. And the increase of his government and of peace, there'll be no end. And he will reign on David's throne. Forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. And then, a notation by Isaiah. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. We must note, first of all, that zeal is an attribute of God. If it is an attribute of God, it must therefore be an attribute of everyone who follows God. If God is zealous, then his followers would be zealous. If it's God's church, then the church would be zealous, not just the first couple of rows. Very interestingly, in the Hebrew, the words zealous and jealous are exactly the same word. And because we have the Spanish ministry here, it is true in Spanish as well. And Victor, you didn't think that I knew Spanish. We need to understand, you mean a zealous God is a jealous God. Let's get a little bit better understanding. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 16. In Ezekiel chapter 16, we see an allegory about Jerusalem, in fact, Israel. And we read these words in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, confront Jerusalem with her detestable practices and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says to Jerusalem. Your ancestry and birth were in the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite, and your mother was a Hittite. Of course, we understand that in a way of speaking, God's people began their quest to take the promised land, which is the land of Canaan. We sang about that today. To Canaan's land, we're on our way. He says, you were born. So to speak, you became a people. You became a nation there in Canaan. 
on that day that you were born. Your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths. No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field, for on the day that you were born, you were despised. That was the plight of the Israelites. They had nobody that cared about them except their God. Verse 6. Then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your blood. Is that intense? And as you lay there in your blood, I said to you, live! I made you grow like a plant in the field. You grew up and developed and became the most beautiful of jewels. Your breasts were formed and your hair grew. You who were naked and bare. But we get to a little bit of a graphic <laughs> scripture right there. It says, I allowed you to live. I made you live, Israel. And then I watched you grow up into this gorgeous woman. Verse 8. Later I passed by, and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you. That's the same phrase that's used in the book of Ruth, where Boaz is called by Ruth to spread the corner of his garment over Ruth. It's a sign of covenant. I covered your nakedness. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord Almighty, and you became mine. He says, I saw you as a little baby who no one cared about. You were going to die, but I said, live. I allowed you to grow like a plant, and you became a gorgeous woman. And the Bible says right here, you became old enough for love. I spread the corner of my garment over you, and I made an oath, and I married you, and you became mine. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, that's the vow. And this is the allegory. Verse 9. I bathed you with water and washed the blood from you, put ointments on you. I clothed you with embroidered dress and put leather sandals on you. I dressed you in fine linen and covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arms and a necklace around your neck. And I put a ring on your nose. Well, everybody has different tastes about beauty, amen. I put a ring on your nose, earrings on your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. He made Israel his wife. His queen. So you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothes were of fine linen and costly fabric and embroidered cloth. Your food was flour, honey, and olive oil. You became very beautiful and rose to be a queen. And your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty. Because of the splendor I had given you, your beauty was perfect, declares the Lord, the sovereign Lord. This is talking about the time of David and Solomon. He says, your fame and your beauty were known amongst all the nations. Verse 15, but you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a prostitute. You lavished your favors on anyone who passed by. Your beauty became his. You took some of your garments to make gaudy high places where you carried on your prostitution. Such things should not happen, nor should they ever occur. You also took the fine jewelry I gave you, the jewelry made of my gold and silver, and you made for yourself male idols and engaged in prostitution. With them, verse 20, and you took your sons and daughters whom you bore to me and sacrificed them as food to idols. Was your prostitution not enough? You slaughtered my children and sacrificed them to idols. In all your decimal practices and your prostitution, you didn't remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare and kicking about in the blood. See, right here, we see a hurt, angry, And jealous God. A zealous God. See, for a lot of people, they don't understand the call to be zealous. To be zealous is to be jealous. God says, I took you as a little baby. 
I called you to live. I raised you to become a beautiful woman. When it came to time for love, I took you. And we made a covenant. And then you forsook it. You went after other lovers. You began to have idols in your life. Things that were more important than me. Why? Because you forgot what I did for you. That's why you strayed from me. You know, I remember summer between my junior and senior year in high school. That goes back a little ways. Some say the last Tyrannosaurus Rexes were running around during those days. But in that summer, I got a crush on this girl named Suzanne Rupp. I mean, she was just gorgeous. Second to Elena, of course. <laughs> she was awesome. I just fell head over heels with her. We went out for a couple of months, totally pure relationship. And then my dad got transferred. My dad was in service. We always moved every one or two years. And we moved, not just a little ways away, we moved from Florida to Chicago, Illinois. And you know, we was com just coming up senior year, and I said, hey, I, I, I'm gonna come back to school. I, I, hopefully I'll get into the University of Florida, and we'll, we'll just keep it going. And so we wrote letters. We called, I mean, email wasn't available. And, and, you know, I kept this going, and, and, and then I, I got this brilliant, awesome idea. I would go down there and surprise her. So I flew down, only for her. I go on up to the door, knock. She opens the door. She says, Kip! I go, Suzanne! She says, I, I didn't expect you! I said, well, aren't you going to invite me in? Uh, okay. So we go on in, and there in the TV room, she introduces me to this guy, her friend. I was, I was heartbroken. I was crushed. I, I, I just felt this, this rush of emotion. I was angry. I was hurt. And she walked me out a few minutes later and says, hey, do you think we could get together and talk tomorrow night and just, just talk? I said, okay. We got together the next night. She says, listen, I, I, I really want to get back to you. I, I know I messed up right here, but I really want to get back. I, I really want a relationship with you. I really missed you. And I said, listen. <laughs> that is the biggest bunch of baloney I've heard. I said, that's it. You wrecked up the relationship. You broke what we had. You deceived me. And I was ticked. Then I got depressed. You see, a lot of times we don't understand God. Why does God get angry? Why is God upset? Because we fail to understand his vision for us as an individual, as his people. God has made a covenant with his people, the church, his bride. And he expects full devotion from every single person in the church. Nothing less will do. There can be no other lovers. There can be no idols. See, we understand that so well when it comes to a marriage relationship. But so many of us just don't understand God and the kind of relationship that he wants from us, the closest, most intimate of relationships. For us, we think of Christianity, first and foremost, as a set of rules, a commitment to be held to. And yet, true Christianity is first and foremost a relationship. Now, there are times in any relationship you feel closer or not so close, but you never allow other idols to come in. You never allow 
other lovers to come. You know how great our God is? Keep reading in chapter 16. This is going to blow you away. Verse 59. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I will deal with you as you deserve because you've despised my oath by breaking the covenant. You know, a lot of us wonder when we go away from God, why our lives are so rotten. Why, why is it rotten? It's because God is ticked off at you. And he's not going to make your life outside of him nice. You know, somehow we think, oh, I, I'm going to leave the Lord, and I expect my life to be nice. Verse 60. Yet I'll remember the covenant I made with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you'll remember your ways and be ashamed when you see your sisters, both those who are older than you and those who are younger. I will give to you as daughters, but not on the basis of my covenant with you. So I will establish my covenant with you, and you will know that I am the Lord God. Then, when I make atonement for you, for all you have done, you will remember and be ashamed and never again open your mouth because of your humiliation, declares the sovereign Lord. God says, okay, I'll take you back. Not just in a trial covenant. Let's just, not like, I'm going to see how it goes for a few weeks. He said, I'm willing to set up an everlasting covenant. Is that exciting? He says, and then prayerfully, you will remember what you've done. And be convicted by it. Amen, church? <laughs> be ashamed by it. And never again grumble or complain against the Lord your God. Amen. You see, when you understand that God is a zealous God, you must understand that that means he's a jealous God. He doesn't want just part of your heart, part of your life. He wants everything. And he deserves it. Because he said to you, live. And you lived. Your life became beautiful. And he made you his queen. The zeal of God. Let's go to John chapter 2. This passage is a passage that mystifies many people who go to church. Beginning in verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle and sheep and doves and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changes and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he says, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your father's house will consume me. Wow. Can you picture this? Jesus goes up to the temple court at the Passover. And he just looks at everything that's going on in the temple courts. He sees the men selling cattle and sheep and doves and others sitting at, at the table exchanging money. But this was not all about God and sacrifice. This is all about these guys making a buck off God. And the Bible says, very interesting, I, I, I love this little verse, verse 15. So he made a whip out of cords. So he made a whip out of cords. You know, to, to make a whip takes a moment. You take one cord, you look around. You take another cord and you bind them together. Take another cord and you're just surveying all that's going on. You take another cord and you bound them together. And then you stand back a second, and the Bible says that he overturns the tables. I mean, he goes, takes the whip, get out of here. Now, the disciples, they're on the sideline right here. 
Some go, do you think he sinned? <laughs> maybe, maybe it's just a little over the top. Can't we just kind of talk this out and be friends? But the interesting thing to me is that, you know, the Old Testament is pretty big. Have you noticed? And out of the entire Old Testament, all of the apostles could only think of one scripture. Zeal for your house will consume me. Now, there's a lot of scriptures there, but that's the only one they could come up with. Zeal. When they saw Jesus, they saw zeal. What was the issue with zeal? He was zealous, but he was jealous. It's one and the same. And he goes, enough with these idols. Enough is enough is enough. Now get these out of here. This was a man that loved God. That was consumed with zeal for God. One might even say he was sold out. There was nothing but God. In his soul. And he was consumed. You know, the temple represented the very presence of God. And Jesus wanted to deal with all the sin. Because you've got to clean it out to be devout. You can attend church all you want. But if you don't clean out the inside of the cup, you are flat and abomination and a hypocrite. You can go to church on Sunday, you can go to midweek. You can carry a Bible around. But if the inside of your soul is not clean, you are not one that walks with Jehovah God. And different than the loving grandfather God that's been painted, that just loves everybody anyway, anyhow, God is a jealous God. He wants all of you. You know, I know about you. I mean, I was really moved by Erlinda's testimony here this morning. Here's this lady. She's probably about the same age as me. And she's up here in tears, apologizing because she's not been sold out. You know, I appreciate her. She's, she's got few knee problems but you know when we went up to climb Mount Hollywood there was no excuse I'm too old it's too high it's too hot I got other things going she was there you know I appreciated Dave Swan last week you know, when Dave first started coming around, he just says, well, you know, I just think I walked away from God. He had no idea that he had fallen away from God. See, there are a lot of people that go to church off and on. They've totally fallen away from the heart. God is not their consuming passion. Their idols are their jobs, their friends, their family. Matter of fact, some churches even teach, hey, it's God, family, church, job. But my Bible says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. It's God and his kingdom and his righteousness. Then your family. Then your job. And then church leadership. Don't get church leadership confused with being a disciple of Jesus Christ. You know, we've, we've got to ask ourselves. We say we are Christians. We are followers of Christ. We call ourselves disciples, people that are learning to be like Christ. Can you see yourself cleaning out the temple? You know, some of us, we're afraid to even mention publicly the name of Jesus. Let alone take a hard line stand. We're so afraid of what people think about us. Oh, man, if I take this hard line stand, someone might say something nasty about me. Or I might be disfellowshipped from what? 
a denomination. Let me tell you something. Jesus took a stand right here, and he was unapologetic. He didn't go back to guys. He goes, guys, I, I was a little over the top today. You know, happens to us all. No, the guys remembered this time where he tried to clean out the temple. Because Jesus was all about God. There were no idols in his life. He was consumed with jealousy for God. Not just for himself, but for everybody around. Let's go to Numbers chapter 25. In Numbers chapter 25, we find a very intense situation right here. Of course, Israel's going to the desert. And we talked a couple weeks ago that the Old Testament is the physical foreshadowing of the spiritual realities of the New Testament. Egypt represents slavery, represents the old life. Crossing the Red Sea is baptism. Wandering in the desert for 40 years, that's the Christian life. Crossing the Jordan is death. And then the promised land is heaven. Amen? Amen. See, we think when we become a Christian, it's go straight to the promised land. The land of milk and honey. No, 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 no. Being a Christian is the desert. Where it's hot. There are poisonous snakes. And there's a heck of a lot of temptations out there. Let's read our Bible. Chapter 25, verse 1. While Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women, who invited them to sacrifice to their gods. The people ate and bowed down before these gods. So Israel joined in worshiping the Baal of Peor, and the Lord's anger burned against them. Wow. Led astray by these Moabite women. They didn't have the same standard as the people of God. And notice when they engaged in sin... Then they changed their religion. See, they didn't change their religion at first. No, no, no. The change of religion came after they compromised and they had to find a religion. They had to find a church where they could be comfortable with that kind of a life. Are you going to be right here, guys? Verse 4. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people, kill them, and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. See, God is a jealous God. So Moses said to Israel's judges, Each of you must put to death those of your men who have joined in worshiping the Baal of Peor. Then an Israelite man brought to his family a Midianite woman right before the eyes of Moses and the whole assembly of Israel while they were weeping at the entrance tent. I mean, you know, look at these people. I mean, they were were crying over their brothers, their sisters, their moms, their dads, their friends, their cousins because they had engaged in idolatry. There wasn't any gloating about, we have the truth. They were hurting. And yet in the midst of this, this dude, this Israelite guy, in front of Moses, the whole Israelite community, he just walks in front of him with this Midianite woman. When Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw this, he left the assembly. He said, Excuse me a moment. Took a spear in his hand and followed the Israelite into the tent. He drove the spear through both of them, through the Israelites and into the woman's body. Then the plague against the Israelites was stopped. But those who died in the plague numbered 24,000. Isn't it interesting? The people of God numbered thousands. Here's this dude. Brazenly. Walks in front of Moses and everybody with this woman, this Midianite woman, goes into his tent to make love. No one says anything. But Phineas goes, Excuse me, can I borrow that spear? (laughs) He doesn't knock on the tent door, he goes in. And God knows what they're doing, whether they're making love or just standing there. 
And the Bible says then the plague was stopped. Verse 10. The Lord said to Moses, Phineas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest has turned my anger away from the Israelites, for he was as zealous as I am for my honor amongst them, so that in my zeal I did not put an end to them. I said, man, he's as zealous for me as I am. He's as zealous for my honor. Therefore, I tell him I'm making a covenant of peace with him. He and his descendants will have the covenant of lasting priesthood because he was zealous for the honor of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. The name of the Israelite who was killed with the Midianite woman was Zimri, son of Salu, the leader of the Simeonite family. And the name of the Midianite woman who was put to death was Cosby, daughter of Zer, a tribal chief of the Midianite family. They were leaders. Leaders are not exempt. As a matter of fact, there's more expected of leaders than the people. When these guys sinned, God was upset. A plague was begun. And only because someone finally took a stand for the honor of God and killed these unrighteous people who brazenly sinned in front of all of Israel was the plague stopped. You see, we need to have a zeal like God. That, that was the cool thing about Phineas. He says, man, God says, man, Phineas, you're just like me. You're as zealous you're as jealous for my honor as I am. You see, for Phineas, it's all about God. It's all about God. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians 5, look at this. this, is, this guys, this is unbelievable. Starts off, says, be imitators of God. Well, is, wasn't that what Phineas was doing, guys? Right? Verse 1. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, of course, joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater. Has he inherits the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, because such things, God's wrath, comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, and we were all in the darkness, amen, guys? But now you are the light of the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. See, we have a charge right here to be like God. He says, I don't want you getting into immorality, impurity, or greed. Because these are idols. Wow, that's Southern California. That's immorality, impurity, and greed. The immorality is rampant. Look at the city, the party life. That's what's worshipped. Impurity. Now, there have been brothers been struggling on the internet, and you don't have a deep conviction that that's an idol that'll send you to hell. It's not just lust, biblically. Struggling with pictures of naked women in immoral acts is impurity. Of course, many times accompanied with masturbation. This is sin. It's gross. The Bible says right here that greed will take you out. How much are you sacrificing? God? I'm not just talking about your money. I'm talking about your heart. What are you doing for the Lord? What are you, what are you doing to try to make a difference? Right here, he says, not only do you deal with your own life, he says, but have nothing to do with these fruitless these darkness, but rather expose them. See, a lot of Christians, they think, well, I'll just, I'll just take care of my life. I don't have the right. No, you have the command to be in other people's lives. You have the command to expose sin. Why? Because you're trying to save them. You're trying to help them. You know, I mean, right here, you know, some people think it's legalistic that we expect people to come Sunday morning church. Wednesday night church, Bible talk, congregational devotional. 
And yeah, you gotta go to the beach party. Oh, gee. Can't go to the beach party? Yeah, I gotta go to the beach party. What? It's not all about the volleyball. Us old guys, when we beat the young guys. I, 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 could, I could feel the bitterness on the other side. We were only in it for the fellowship. All jokes aside. All right, it's fun. But you know something, I, I, I lost the game, but I had fun in that one too. Because all jokes aside, it was all about God and the fellowship. Where's your priorities? Say, well, I, something more important, I got my job. Something more important, I got this friend. Something more important, I got this happening. I got that happening. There's nothing more important than God in this kingdom. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Your schedule's more important than God. That's what you're saying. You know, the challenge is, I think, for, and I'm going to speak to the men here directly. I think there are two challenges many of us men have, and that's purity and controlling our tempers. I mean, it disgusts me when I fall into lust. I, I've fallen into internet pornography. It's, it's a sin. It's gross. To have to explain it to Elena or to confess it to the brothers, that's gross. I hate it. But you know, one of the sins that I think that men dismiss along with impurity is anger. Anger is a very hurtful sin. Particularly to those around us, our wives and our children. You know, uh, Wednesday was my 35th spiritual birthday. I was, I was cranking. I got up, had a cranking quiet time, filled my schedule just trying to help people. I mean, it was, it was awesome. I, I drove all the way to Ventura, you know, helping this guy and that guy and this guy out. And I came home and I go, wow. And then you feel good when you've worked for the Lord. You know what I'm talking about? And Elena came on in. It was about 10 after 11. And, and it was my 30, did I mention this? My 35th spiritual birthday, and I, and, I, and I hadn't watched TV for, I don't know, a week or so. And I just flicked on the TV, and, and, I, and CSI was on. I didn't think much of it, but I sat down, and uh, Elena sat there for a second. She says, you know, I, I've got to get ready. And so, you know, Elena takes about 20 minutes to get everything on the face done. You know what I'm talking about? So I said, amen. So I'm watching CSI. I'm getting into it. I mean, it's all intense. You know what's going on? And then she comes back about, I don't know, about 20 till. And she goes, let's go to bed. Now, now this was not a romantic interlude that she was talking about. She's just talking about time to hit the sack here and go to bed. I go, babe, I'm watching CSI. It's my 35th spiritual birthday. <laughs> she says, no, honey. Let's go to bed. We need to go to bed. It's a long day. we got a big day tomorrow. No, honey. I'm watching CSI. <laughs> she goes over to the TV, pushes a bunch of buttons, none of them being the off button. <laughs> this is, you know, we're in a rented spot. I don't know how to work this TV thing. And then finally she hits the off button. She goes, it's time to go to bed. No, I don't want to go to bed. Goes, okay. So then I'm sitting there, and I got the remote in my hand. I'm trying to go like this. And Lena had hit some buttons. I'm sitting there. I got so, I just wanted to take that remote and just throw it on the ground there. Like that, you know. I sat there, I go, oh, I guess God doesn't want me to watch CSI. <laughs> so I put the remote down, went into the bedroom, and apologized. Because I understood, this wasn't about Elena. This was about me honoring God. And the thing that was really bad is I saw Elena's face when I got ticked off and mad. She's like that. And, I, and you know, when that happens, you know you've blown it. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. Nick, you know what I mean. <laughs> See, guys, being pure, being righteous is honoring God, is being zealous, is being jealous for God. Let's go to 2 Samuel for our last point. Zeal celebrating God. That sounds good, doesn't it, church? Yeah. Zeal celebrating God. Second Samuel. One of my favorite books. Second Samuel chapter 6. Right here, David's been made king of both Judah and Israel. He's fired up because he's going to bring the ark of God back into Jerusalem to show that God is really with his people. Amen, guys? Verse 12, chapter 6, 2 Samuel. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went down and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fatted calf. I mean, is that intense? They're carrying the ark and every six step they kill a bull. Blood squirts out. Kill a cat. The blood squirts out. Oh, that's awesome. Verse 14. David wearing a linen ephod danced before the Lord with all of his might. He is fired up. While he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from the window. Now she's also David's wife. And when he, she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of God and set in its place inside the tent that David had pitched forward. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings for the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of the Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. I mean, everybody's fired up. They're all celebrating. Everybody's going, oh, thanks for the cakes. This is awesome. This is awesome. This is great. Verse 20. When David returned home, so here's King David. He's heading home now. To bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. See, most likely there, there may have not been any undergarments under the ephod itself. And so David is in a zealous joy right there. <laughs> 21. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father. It's getting a little intense. Or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Translated, they had no sex. It, the marriage was over. You know, it's interesting to me. In marriages, just the way things seem to work, there's one that has a tendency to be very zealous for God, and the other claims to be very level-headed. Now, I don't know which one you are. In this particular case, David was the one that was celebrating and dancing and just fired up. And McCall goes, not <laughs> just despised him. And it's interesting to me how many times in our former fellowship one of the spouses begins to despise the zeal of the other and it takes them both out and there are divorces i remember a few months ago i won't name the church but there was a church that began their service by announcing three divorces one of them being an elder you go what happened it's not about the marriage it's not about the, it's all about god if you and your spouse, stay faithful to God, you're going to be married. 
You're going to stay married. You're going to make it. If one of you decides not to, your marriage most likely will break up. And you may take both of you out. How should we view marriage? Well, let's go to our last scripture, Hebrew 13. In Hebrews 13, verse 4, marriage should be honored by all. Do we honor a church? And the marriage bed be kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid, what can man do to me? Now that's a cranking scripture right there. You guys that aren't married, just take notes right here. You'll need the scripture later. <laughs> the first part, though, we need to revere the brothers and sisters in the church that are married. It is good to be married. Amen. And the young people, we need to honor those that are married. Those of us in marriage, the marriage bed needs to be kept pure. No lust, no impurity, and no immorality. For God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Then it says, look at this. Keep your lives free from the love of money. See, a lot of people think the love of money is just the rich people. Oh, no. A poor person can love money, too. They just don't have it. See, they go... Poor person goes, oh, good, I don't have to worry about that scripture. Oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> he says, and be content with what you have. I want to ask you, are you content with what you're earning right now? Maybe you're not content because you're not paying all the bills because you're greedy and you're overspending. See, one of the quickest ways to get bitter is to be attacked financially. When you attack financially, it takes away that security. Stress comes, and you're just, not, you're just not content. And you start trying to make it happen. And you get your eyes off of the Lord. You know what I'm talking about right here, guys? And yet, the, the Bible says right here, God has said, never will I leave you. He says, you know, even in financial crisis, got your back. I'm there. I'm, I'm never going to forsake you. I am the faithful husband that's always going to take care of you. And, and it isn't, wives, isn't that what you always wanted from your husband? It's the knight in shiny armor that would always be there in the darkest of time and just put his arm around you and say, listen, babe, I'm all over this. Don't worry about it. So that's God. Therefore, in verse 6, we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I'll not be afraid. What can man do to me? What can a man do? You know, one of the things that the Portland Church taught Elena and myself when we first got there is when, when you're doing lousy spiritually, you become very man-focused. What do people think about me? What are they thinking? What are they saying? But a spiritual person is very God-focused. They, they say, listen, what does God think? What do I need to do to please the Lord? You see, I believe that being a disciple is fun. Now, it's torture if you're not sold out. I mean, when you're straddling the fence, it's torture. You, you see those little... Uh, cards it has a donkey straddling the fence you know right there that's how a lot of us are we got one foot in the church we got one foot in the world you are an unhappy person you are tortured in your soul but the person that's given wholeheartedly to god they go well what can man do to me it's awesome i'm content god's with me all the way i have nothing to fear god will take care of me as long as I obey his word and honor him with a jealousy that's like his. You know, we're very blessed to be able to have uh, one of the brothers on the, the mission team, uh, Mike Mathis, Jr. 
And uh, Mikey's very special to all of us from Portland because it's a special story of company with his parents. His mom, Flo, became a disciple. And her husband, Mike Sr., persecuted her for five years. Tried to stop her from going to church. Called her names. Just tried to stop her from being devoted to God. You know what happened after five years? He turned himself in, became a disciple. He goes, well, it looks like she's not going to change. See, a lot of times we want to convert our spouse. We think, I'll compromise, I'll compromise, I'll compromise. Therefore, I'll be closer to them. Not understanding that you can only win a person to a point of compromise if you compromise. You've got to keep your commitment strong. There can be no compromise. But the awesome thing is, Mike became sold out. And I'll never forget, he started to get worried about his kids spiritually. And the church down where they're from was just scattered. It was a mess. And uh, he had friends up in uh, Portland. And so he came up to visit, you know, Mike Sr. and Flo and with Mikey Jr. And they came in January, and they all loved it. It was awesome. And then he would say, well, come and, and be with us and worship with us. And they thought about it, but the cost was just too much to move all the way to Portland, Oregon. But on the way back, when they're going back, they noticed their son was very quiet in the back seat. As a matter of fact, when they turned around, they noticed he was crying. I said, what's wrong? He said, I just don't want to leave. I found young people that were like me that really wanted the Lord. But the parents still decided they were going to do it their way. They were afraid to make the jump. Four or five months later, Mikey didn't want to go to church anymore. We get this emergency phone call. Bro, we'll do whatever it takes. We want our son to be faithful, whatever it takes. We want to send him on up this summer. And if you guys will take, take care of him, uh, then, then we'll pay any amount of money to take care of him. If you could just, you don't have to get him baptized or nothing. Just, just get him going to church again. Of course, we said, amen. We did. He came on up, and I'll never forget the first service. We had church, and then after church in Portland and here, we always have a, a leaders meeting just to make sure that everybody's followed up on it, people are taken care of. And uh, we are, our leaders meetings are all open, and so we have visitors, non-Christians even come to our leaders meetings. And so Mikey came to the leaders meeting. And in our little circles, we, we say, hey, you know, how, how, how's it coming? Did we get set up some new studies today? And I think it was Vic Jr. that was leading the teens at that particular time. And he looks around and says, well, did we set up any new studies? And none of the guys, you know, said anything. He goes, ah. Oh. Well, then Mikey raises his hand. He goes, well, I'd, I'd like to be a new study. <laughs> Three weeks later, he was baptized into Christ. <laughs> One month later, his parents moved to Portland. And today, they're elders in training. Is that incredible, guys? But what if Flo didn't take her stand? What if Mike Sr. and Flo didn't make the decision, listen, I've got to be at a church that's sold out, that's zealous for God. See, God is a zealous God. He's a jealous God. The true church is going to be a zealous church. A jealous church that won't allow their beloved brothers and sisters to worship idols, but to be totally in love with God. Thanks. God bless.